both Jesus and his followers considered him to be divine. But there were also Roman Caesars who were considered gods and other divine-like beings in the Old Testament. This raises a fascinating question, namely, in what sense was Jesus considered God in the New Testament and in the early church? Our guest today, Dr. Michael Bird, is back to the show. He's a leading New Testament scholar all the way from Australia. He's going to help us think through this. Written a book, Mike, I read this twice. It's 400 pages. It's not a popular level book, but it's readable to non-scholars. Thoroughly enjoyed it and cannot wait to dive into some of these questions with you. Well, Sean, thank you for having me back again. And it's great to be with you and joining your listeners and viewers. Well, let's jump in and do it. Sometimes Christians will say things like make the case that Jesus is God and then assume such a case settles the matter. It's not that simple, is it? Uh, Unfortunately, it's not. I mean, mean, on the one hand, there used to be this view that Jesus was a mere man. And then much later, you know, maybe in the Gospel of John or maybe in the fourth century, they decided or voted on him as divine. I'm, I, I think that idea, that that somewhat um, atheist urban myth has been well and truly busted. Uh, no, Jesus was regarded as divine, I think, from the very beginning, certainly, you know, mm. after he you know, rose and, and was exalted to heaven. Uh, but the question is, what did the early church mean by that? Because mm. in antiquity, in the ancient world, there were different ways of being divine. You know, could someone be divine like, uh, like you know, the Roman god Jupiter or, or Juno or Minerva? Or were they like Heracles, you know, uh, a semi-divine being who was then wafted up into heaven? Or maybe they were kind of like a Roman emperor who was thought to have been deified upon death. I mean, that, that's allegedly what happened to Julius Caesar and the Roman emperor Augustus and others. Or was Jesus divine in the sense that angels are divine or mm. or we can look at other parts of jewish literature like that enigmatic figure the uh, the son of man from one enoch so out of all these different ways of being divine in what way was jesus divine that's kind of what i explore in the book well it's a super fascinating question and i think the title of your book is interesting because it says jesus among the gods And as I reflected on a little bit, I thought, wait a minute, that implies that there's other gods or at least a firm belief in other gods during the life and ministry of Jesus. We could look in the Jewish background. We could look in the Greco-Roman world. Let's start with the Greco-Roman world. What are some of the views of the divine, the differing views about what it meant to be a god in that culture at that time? Well, generally, uh, it seems as if people in the the Greek and the Roman world thought about two categories of deity. There were what they call unbegotten or uncreated gods, so that these people would be like absolute divine beings. Uh, Mm. I mean, you know, they may have actually been created themselves from another sort of, you know, uh, supreme deity. And then there were people who were kind of like promoted into divinity, like a Roman emperor who's kind of, you know, um, regarded as deified upon death or someone who's assumed and taken up into heaven. Uh, maybe the way to think about it is, is kind of like um, the parliaments they have in the United Kingdom where you've got like the House of Lords, which is something okay. of a hereditary you know, privilege and, and honorific status. And then you've got um, the House of Commons where you get kind of nominated and voted into public office. So you could think of it like that distinction between the okay. House of Lords and, and the commons, those two classes of divinity. But that's the level of being. Um, the other thing you have to say about divinity in the ancient world, it wasn't like the gods were up there, okay? Uh, mm. In the Greco-Roman world, the gods were very much down here, here. Either they would, you know, take on human form and they would appear, they would manifest themselves in different ways. But most of all, you could say that the ancient Greek and Roman gods were the mighty mightiest forces within the world they weren't Mm. these sort of spiritual beings apart from the world they kind of lived within and permeated the entire world that's why you could have you know the gods of bees you know the gods of the ocean you know you could have the gods of sex the gods of silver the gods of money the gods Mm. for different vocations the god of a particular area so divinity was regarded as the supernatural power that pervaded the entire world and, and touched every area 
part of life. So that, that's one of the senses in which uh, the Greco-Roman world, uh, philosophers, poets, and, and the civil, political religion, the way they thought about uh, divinity. Okay, so if Jesus made claims to be God and his followers made claims that he's God, how would that have been received in the Greco-Roman culture at that time? Like, how did they filter such a claim uh, that was made about the uniqueness of Jesus? Yeah, well, it very much would depend upon your own background, doesn't it? I mean, if you're kind of uh, nurtured in the Jewish tradition where you understand that there is the one God of creation and covenant, and you know that there are angels, you know that there are, you know, prophets who are called, you know that that God can raise up and send a king, that type of thing. You're going to be using those sort of categories to think about the sense in which Jesus is both uh, divine and an agent of um, Israel's God. But if you're coming from a Greco-Roman background, uh, I mean, that's a slightly different context. You're not constrained by monotheism. Uh, I mean, you you could be very happy to think of Jesus as someone like a Hercules. And and that may Mm. well have influenced the way that, um, let's let's call them pagans, shall we? Um, The the way they thought about Jesus. They may have thought he was like, you know, divinized the way a Roman emperor became divine or like Heracles or the healing god Asclepius. I mean, there's all sorts of different ways they could think about that. Uh, You know, maybe when they read the Gospel of Mark, they thought that Jesus becomes divine pretty much straight after he dies. That's why the centurion says, you know, surely this man was the son of God. Um, Or else, you know, when they read in Philippians 2 that Jesus is equal to God. I mean, well, that language of being equal to God, that was something they would often say about Roman emperors, you know, because Mm. uh, he was so, Augustus, he was so great. He brought us peace, prosperity. I mean, we we regard him as equal to the Olympian gods. I mean, you could find stuff like that in, in antiquity. So the way in which people conceived of divinity may well have been determined in, in no small part by the background that they were coming from. And what we see in the New Testament, I think, are people who are, who are you, know, you know, apostles, Jewish Christians for the most part, who are thinking about Jesus largely in Jewish categories, okay. essentially in light of the the categories of the Jewish scriptures, but they're also cognizant of the way this may sound in the Greco-Roman world. So, you know, son of God can mean one thing uh, in in the Jewish Bible. Um, It can mean, you know, to be an Israelite, to be an angel, to be an Israelite king. But in the Greco-Roman world, it can be to be the the designated heir of a deified emperor. So that's the different things you've got to negotiate when we think about certain things. What do they mean in the Jewish context and what do they mean in the Greco-Roman context? That's really helpful. And arguably, when we look and say Mark, maybe for a more Roman context might be different than Matthew, a more Jewish context can help explain some of the differences that are in there. But we may come back to that. Now, we've talked a little bit about the Greco-Roman culture. Let's shift to the Jewish culture. Obviously, you said Christianity came primarily and essentially out of the Jewish culture. But you talk about what's called intermediate figures. Give us some example of what these are, and they're kind of these in-between figures that are human or greater than human, but they're not Yahweh. What are some of these intermediate figures in Jewish tradition, whether canonical or not? Yeah, well, I mean, there's there's a number of them. Probably the most famous and the most perplexing is the uh, the angel of the Lord that you know you, you find in the the Pentateuch. Now, this figure is is really enigmatic because the angel seems to speak on behalf of Yahweh in the first person, but it's very clear it's an angel. It's 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 not it's it's not Yahweh. You know that kind of a thing. And so you know I, I call him Schrodinger's angel because he's simultaneously hmm. Yahweh and not <laughs> Yahweh, and it's 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 it's, it's, it's it is kind of perplexing. Uh, But he seems to be the angelic representative of Yahweh. And and some great things are said about him. You know, this is the angel in whom Yahweh's name dwells. You know, we're we're told that in in, in the book of Exodus. So so the angel of the Lord is one clear figure. Uh, You've got a variety of angels. Uh, Some are very prominent, you know, like uh, Michael, who's a a very prominent angelic figure there um, in the sort of angelic hierarchy. You have this very interesting figure as well in Daniel 7, the one like a son Mm. of man. I mean, you know, You could have a whole episode on who the Son of Man is. And he comes to the Ancient of Days, so he's clearly differentiated from from Israel's God. 
he can he can possibly have some angelic traits since in the book of daniel angels are described with human-like attributes and, and and appearance but he seems to represent god's reign uh he seems to be a symbol of israel the saints of the most high uh but he also can be a type of messianic figure as well because he hmm. stands as the heavenly counterpart to the arrogant horn who is terrorizing God's people and making great posts, uh, boasts hmm. against God. So, I mean, th that's a very interesting figure. And we can also talk about uh, wisdom, you know, Proverbs 8. You talk about how wisdom is this craftsman through his side, uh, that God creates the world by his word or through his wisdom. And that becomes very important in Jewish Hellenistic literature when people are writing in Greek, like in the Wisdom of Solomon, or even someone else like Ben Sirach, or he writes in Hebrew, gets translated to Greek. Uh, but they see a very prominent place for wisdom as a kind of companion or, or consort uh, with God through whom he seems to, to work and, and, and implant his wisdom in Torah amongst the people of Israel or even in the temple. So yeah, there's a variety of these intermediary figures and some of them do have a degree of parody or a degree of similarity with how uh, Jesus is portrayed in the New Testament. So for example, the way Ben Sirah portrays wisdom is very similar to how John the Evangelist portrays Jesus as the word made flesh. Um, you know, in the book of Revelation, uh, Jesus on the one hand is the Lamb of God who stands with um, you know, the Lord Almighty, but in other senses, he can also be portrayed as having angelic traits uh, like Michael or like Gabriel or something like that. So these Jewish intermediary figures are quite well relevant for how the early church um, explained their own faith and their own relationship to Jesus. So at the heart of kind of what your project is, is you look in the Greco-Roman culture and there's these different levels of deities. In some cases are human and gods like maybe Julius Caesar was, etc. Or Alexander the Great in some contexts were. You look in this Jewish uh, background, both canonical and non, there's personified wisdom. There's the angel of the Lord. There's these beings that are clearly greater than human beings, have some divine-like characteristics and qualities. How much are these so-called intermediate figures contributing to, and in what way, the way the early church speaks about Jesus? Is that the heart of the question? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, there's no doubt that these intermediary figures, I think both um, Jewish and, and Greco-Roman, are relevant for the way people are thinking about Jesus and portraying Jesus. I mean, the, the okay. most the most relevant, I think, are the Jewish categories. So, you know, Jesus can be described as wisdom. He can be described as having angelic characteristics, and he can be obviously described as, as clearly a messianic figure and as a son of God. But what we also see happening uh, in, in, I think, in the New Testament and beyond is they're not just saying Jesus is one of the in-betweeners, okay? They're saying there are things that are, that are either unique to Yahweh or predicated of Israel's God, which can also be predicated of Jesus. Mm. Uh, now, the clearest examples of that, I think, you, are, you get in the, in, in the Philippian uh, Christ hymn or the Christ poem, where the, the, the monotheistic rhetoric of Isaiah 45 you know mm. uh, that you know, you know Yahweh is the one to whom every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. That's applied to Jesus. I mean that that's that's very clear. Or the way that Paul takes the Shema, Israel's monotheistic confession. Here, Israel, the Lord our God is one. You know he he takes that and it puts Jesus in the middle of it. You know so um, so Yahweh is God, but Jesus is the Lord within that formula. And they, they, they can apply a creative role. Yes, God creates, but he creates in and through his word. And that word is Jesus, which means Jesus stands on the uh, creator side of the creator-creature div uh, division. So if there's creatures here, uncreated gods here, Jesus is on the uncreated hmm. side. And that, that means they're making uh, elevated claims. Partly, yes, Jesus has the characteristics or agents or form of an intermediary figure, but they can also describe him as an uncreated deity for which the most natural parallel is not an angel. It's not a divinized emperor. The most natural parallel for Jesus then becomes none other mm. than Israel's God. Okay, wow. And it's that distinction that sets Jesus apart from all of these other intermediate figures 
in the Jewish or Greco-Roman uh, context and background. Super helpful. Now, let me read a line from your book and you can kind of tell us what you mean by this. Because if I isolated this, some people might think, what on earth mm. is Bird saying here? You said, quote, Jesus is then a bit like a Jewish Hercules, an apotheosized Augustus, or an archangel. But he is a lot like the Jewish deity Yahweh. Now, right away, some people might think, wait a minute. You are finding, yes, he's ultimately like Yahweh, but you are finding his identity and explaining him in terms of these other gods. What do you mean by this? Okay, this is what I'm. This is what I'm concerned with, and I'm taking my cue here from uh, an American scholar who, who um, researches down the road from me, David Litwa. I think he makes a good point. He says, "Look, when you're talking about Jesus and these other deities of antiquity, he says, look, if you focus on the similarities, you end up with parallelomania, and that's just saying this is that. So yeah, Jesus is divine, but you know he's divine in the same sense of Hercules, or he's divine in the same sense of a." deified Roman emperor. You know, this is that. It's all the same. The problem with that is um, it, it's a conflation and you flat out the distinctives between the two. Mm. Okay. So that, that's the problem with parallel mania. It says it's, it's all pretty much just the same, uh, but not, not, nothing is truly the same. I mean, things might be similar, but everything has discrete differences. So if you focus just on similarities, it's parallel mania. But then again, if you focus entirely on the differences, uh, then you're kind of just, you know, uh, allowing the the apologetic concern to drive everything. So, mm. yeah, look, I, I think there are big differences between the way uh, people thought that the Roman Emperor Augustus was divine uh, compared to how they thought Jesus was divine. I, I think there are, you know, big major differences, but those differences don't remove or eliminate what are some of the genuine similarities. I mean, you know, both could be called a son of God. I mean, they may define sonship and godness indifferently, but they're, sure. they're, they're both defined that way. Uh, if you read the uh, the ascension of Jesus or accounts of his exaltation, it does sound at least a little bit uh, about the process of apotheosis or, or deification, whereby an emperor or some hero from antiquity would be taken up into heaven, would become divine. I mean, um, we, we can't really deny those similarities because they were there. And also the church fathers tell us about those similarities. You get someone like Justin Martyr, and he's very aware that Jesus can sound a little bit like um, Her Her uh, Hermes or a Perseus, or, or he can his death may sound like some you know demigod who suffered and is being vindicated. I mean, the, the church fathers were very aware of these similarities. And they could actually use them as a kind of a starting point to mm. talk to various, you know, uh, critics and inquirers of their own faith uh, to help them understand what they meant by saying Jesus was divine and this God is different because this is the God who died and rose for our own salvation and redemption. So I think it's very important we've got to maintain both the similarities and the differences because if you major just on one similarities, it's parallelomania. If you focus on the differences, then you're trying to do everything just out of the uh, just out of the apologetic mileage you get out of it, and sometimes running roughshed over the actual uh, similarities that are generally there. That's really helpful. You know, I'm obviously an apologist, but what I probably haven't told you is I, I went through a pretty significant season of doubt. I was probably 19 years old, and it was the first time I heard this idea that Jesus was just a copycat savior from these pagan deities. And saw these huge lists online basically saying there's nothing unique about Christianity. And it kind of rocked me. And so it's made me go, wait a minute, there's some major differences here that can't be accounted for. But the danger in just doing that is missing that the culture in which Jesus is being communicated in, the language that is being used, and the way people at that time would have understood some of the teachings of Jesus. So that balance is one thing I really appreciated that you brought out in your book. I think mm. both skeptics who focus too much on parallel mania and apologists like myself who are going to focus on the differences can miss some of that middle ground. So thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought I thought it was uh, it was really helpful. Yeah, um, yeah, and let me add to that. I mean, I'm, please. I, I have no problem with apologetics. I, I engage it myself. Guess what I'm calling for is making sure that our apologetics – 
uh, is not simply a knee-jerk reaction mm. to the people who want to say that Jesus is just a rip-off of Egyptian deities. I mean, I, I'm sure there was, like, what, 15 years ago, there was that big video that got like a million hits saying Jesus is yeah, just basically right. a god of Cyrus in a slightly different form and cut and paste and a little bit of Dan Brown, Da Vinci Code. Um, you know, we don't want to do a knee-jerk reaction to that and come up with our own... Um, uh, over enthusiastic counter assertions to counter some falsehoods uh that the best thing we can do uh, apologetically theologically historically is lay out the evidence in a clear compelling and concise mm. way and for me the the major difference between jesus and all the other all the deities i mean you can find sing singular similarities but the, the biggest difference is what I call the, the kerygmatic aggregate. And by kerygma, I mean the, the proclamation. If you take all of the things that the early church was saying about Jesus, uh, the pre-existent son of God becomes human, suffers, dies, is exalted. Uh, he's the one through whom um, the, the world will be reconciled, uh, defeat, suffering, death defeated dispenses his spirit to his followers receives the same worship of yahweh i would say that entire aggregate the entire package is what is unique i don't need jesus to be unique in every single aspect okay mm. so yeah a few people are called the sons of god a few people are thought to have ascended to heaven uh, a few other beings are, uh, or, or people are called the messiah uh, it's not the singular thing it's the complete package that I think that 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 charismatic aggregate that shows what is really distinctive and what was really in in the eyes of a lot of pagans absolutely mind blowing that anyone would believe this uh, mm. because there were bits and pieces that m may have made sense to them but the entire narrative the entire package definitely set the Christians apart from anything that was in the Greco Roman world. As you know, C.S. Lewis talked about kind of the myth-made fact, how we see these similarities in these dying and rising gods and these themes in the different literature of the world. But of course, with Jesus is when it becomes historical and true. Are you comfortable looking at a lot of these intermediate figures, whether in the Jewish context or the Roman context, and saying, you know what, this is, this is God's way of allowing or preparing our hearts, in a sense, that there are close similarities to the Christian story. So when it ultimately comes, we recognize what's unique about Jesus. Like, how do you look at some of those similarities that, of course, are not completely in the whole found as we do in the person of Jesus? But at times, there's some interesting parallels there. Yeah, I think it's a bit of both. In one sense, you could argue that it's kind of, you know, God is giving people a, a, a mythology, a history, language, and terms that will help them make sense of what happens. Um, th but then there's an also sense in which, you know, um, people are making sense of Jesus in light of the history and their culture that they know. And God is using that to help to help to, to mm. using their own categories and culture to explain to them who he is and who their son is. Because ultimately, uh, if we believe in divine revelation, you know, God's got to talk to us in a language we understand and we can we can accommodate. God, well, God has to accommodate himself to us. So I think it's a bit of both. It's a little bit of preparation, but God's simply using uh, the language terms, categories of antiquity, so we know something of him and what God has done for us in his son and the giving of the spirit. That's really helpful. Let's take a couple of these and break them down and see how you would you would explain some of these figures. You you walk through in your book, for example, certain intermediate characters like personified wisdom. Uh, you mentioned this a little bit earlier, but obviously in kind of the wisdom literature books, uh, in the sense of personified, it's like wisdom acts and wisdom speaks. Mm -hmm. How should in light, do we only understand that fully looking back after Jesus has come and his wisdom in human flesh? Is that a precursor to it? Did that shape the development of how the early church understand Jesus to be? Give us some thoughts on personified wisdom and its contribution to Christology. Yeah, I think, I think it's both um, 
sort of preparation, but then it's a retrospective rereading. So it's a little bit of both. Let me let okay. me explain. Okay. So you know, the early church has has experienced the event of Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection, and his exaltation. And immediately this reminds them of stuff. Okay, because if Jesus is the agent of uh, salvation and new creation, then obviously he must be the agent of the original creation as well. If God uses him for new creation, then God probably used him for the original creation. So I think, well, who else do we know of is involved with Yahweh in creation? Think, well, you know, there's God's word and God's wisdom. Think, oh, yeah, well, Jesus must be the very wisdom of God. Mm -hmm. And they go back in light of their messianic faith and they read the Old Testament and think, well, if you read Proverbs 8 as talking about Jesus, you know, it, it kind of does make sense. I mean, it might be a few little head-scratching things where you talk about the generation of wisdom, but it, it's something along those lines where, you know, wisdom provides one of the categories that was already there to make sense of Jesus, but then they go back and read it in light of their uh, their own faith and their experience of the of the exalted Lord. And, and it becomes coherent from them in terms of their experience their uh, profession of faith, what they've seen and heard about Jesus, and how it all kind of matches up with the with the Christian scriptures. So that, that, that's probably that's probably a good one. They can think that you know wisdom is something we can identify with um, Jesus, and that helps to clarify what we've experienced, and it provi provides extra coherence to our reading of scripture. So when you say it's fair to say the backdrop for the person of Jesus, who claims to be Yahweh in human flesh really only makes sense in the backdrop of the Jewish thinking and scriptures. But the scriptures alone are not going to get you there until they experienced Jesus personally and then look back and see things in a new light. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think, it, I think it's a mixture of experience and exegesis. Uh, in okay. fact, I would say they're two of the most primary things that are driving the Christology of the early church. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's like a bomb's gone off and they're trying to make sense of what has happened. And they're going through the Jewish scriptures, finding categories, figures, types, profiles that are going to help them understand uh, who, who is Jesus, what has he done, and who is he uh, in relation to us and in, in relation to Israel's one God. So sometimes the skeptics, not all, but some will point back and say, hey, the Christians came up with this belief in Jesus and then they go back and start finding passages and scriptures in the Old Testament that fit this preconceived narrative, you wouldn't disagree to a sense that they do go back and look at things through a new lens, but what's missing there is what accounts for their belief in Jesus in the first place, and that yeah. can't be found alone within the scriptures themselves. Is that fair? I think that's exactly right. Um, you know, the Christians could say the things about, I mean, Jesus taught, you know, the things that happened to the Messiah were according to the scriptures, okay? But that's a that's that's the scriptures when understood in a certain way. Mm. Uh, when people read Isaiah 53, you know, like in the 4th century BC, they weren't saying, well, obviously this means there's going to be a Messiah who's going to die and rise from the dead and the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name. Uh, that's not something they would necessarily have immediately have gone to. But when the first Christians, you know, ex experienced the event of Jesus and then they went to Isaiah 53, they went, oh, now, well, this makes completely sense. This this describes Jesus as the servant. I mean, you know, uh, Jesus described himself as a kind of servant of Yahweh. So this, this makes perfect sense. And Jesus deliberately acted out certain things from Isaiah. I mean, he, he, he you know, used that book frequently, particularly chapter 61 when he was in Nazareth. Um, so it, it makes sense to, to do that retrospective reading. But here's the thing, you can only read that stuff back if there's something there actually to read. You hmm. can only latch on to something with your messianic faith if there's something there that, that's latchable in the first place. And so that's why I won't say they've just gone back and they haven't just gone back and made it up. They've gone back and realized if you read the New Testament, so the Old Testament in a certain way, in a certain through a certain lens, through a certain grid, it actually creates coherences rather than loses them. And and and, and that was that was their point. And you know, and, and that was what some of the uh, the debates were even in the early church between say the Arians and the, uh, the what we would call the pro Nicenes uh, about you know what is the most coherent way of reading the Old Testament uh, to understand 
the church's worship and faith. Uh, and, and this mm. is why someone like Athanasius could say, well, you know, if Jesus is a created being and you're not meant to worship created being, it means our our worship is, is blasphemous because everyone agreed Jesus mm. should be worshipped. But if Jesus is a mere creature, even if he's a supreme uber angel, if he's a creature, worshipping a creature would be idolatry. So mm. however we think of Jesus, he can't be a a created creature because that would mean our worship is blasphemous so it's 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 kind of like trying to find the type of coherences in reading the old testament that match up the text with their own experience of faith now it does seem that there's certain psalms like psalms 2 and psalms 110 that seem to ascribe divine type characteristics to the messiah so did that only make sense looking back or is there somewhat of an anticipation that the Messiah might be more than just human and be divine? And if so, why was the claims of Jesus so resisted? Yeah. Well, I mean, you do find someone like Justin Martyr talking to a Jew like Trifo and Trifo says, look, we expect the Messiah just to be an ordinary guy. He'll come in, probably kick out the Romans and establish a new kind of, you know, Davidical Solomonic kingdom. I mean, that's one view. But there were views out there, even in the, the scriptures, that had a very elevated um, understanding of what this coming Davidic deliverer would be. Uh, before I take you to, to the Psalms, I mean, the, the number one place I think to go to is Isaiah 9, where okay. there is this incredible accumulation of titles that are, are applied to this forthcoming Davidic deliverer. Uh, he's called at one point El Gabor which in Hebrew means mighty God. When mm. that's translated into Greek, they, they, they put that as, I think, um, uh, angelos megaleboule or something like that, which means angel of the great council. Now, if you're ca calling someone mighty God and angel of the great council, mm. by any stretch of the imagination, you're thinking about them in pretty um, venerative terms. Okay, this is, this, mm. is, this, is, this is an exceptional individual. Now, the debate is, is this just part of the sort of the royal rhetoric that you would find in the ancient Near East? Sure, you know, that, sure. the God, that the gods of Egypt or the gods of Babylon would be given all these, you know, very splendid, elevated titles. Or is there really a kind of divine quality being predicated of this mm. coming Davidic deliverer? And that, that gets intensified. And, and what is really amazing, I think, uh, in Psalm 110, is that you have a figure who's going to be co-enthroned with Yahweh. Now, this is this is called being a throne sharer. And, and this is a good example of the sort of parallels in antiquity because you can go look at uh, Egyptian iconography, the way the pharaohs mm -hmm. were uh, portrayed as, you know, sharing thrones with some of their own gods or even in ancient Near Eastern religion or certainly in Roman religion. You could find uh, a picture of uh, someone like uh, the Roman Emperor Augustus being co-enthroned with Jupiter. Or once Augustus becomes divine, you get someone like uh, Claudius, you know, his great, great mm. nephew being co-enthroned with Augustus. To be co-enthroned with a deity was a, a well-known category in antiquity for someone who was really divine in a mighty way. Uh, which is why at his trial, when Jesus quotes Psalm 110 and combines it with Daniel 7, that's why the high priest Caiaphas, you know, tears his robe. I mean, this is blasphemy. I mean, you've just claimed literally the highest position there is for someone who is besides the supreme deity, you know, Yahweh or whoever that is, to be co-enthroned with them. Not, not like have your own little baby thrown next to them, but to <laughs> be a throne sharer with them. This is one of the ultimate claims. And this goes how to show that the language of ruler cults in antiquity uh, appears in the Jewish um, tradition and it then also finds its way into Christianity. Now, people want to say to that, well, obviously then, uh, all of Christianity, and particularly in, in Judaism, even the, the, the Jewish um, nation accepted the kind of divinization of its own kings and that's and that's that's jewishness and that becomes christian but there, there is a key difference because uh the in the jewish world they may have revered their kings somewhere like you know isaiah 9 mm -hmm. or psalm 110 or or psalm 2 but they never worshipped their king in the jewish mm. world 
the same way they did in Egypt or Babylon or Mesopotamia. And I forget who it was uh, who said it, but one scholar is right, is that the, the Israelite king, you know, was the subject of cultic concern, but mm. not cultic devotion. Now, cultic here mm. means like a type of ritualized, specialized worship you would find in the temple. So the, 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 in, in the Jewish worldview, the, the king was, in, in a sense, in a couple of different senses, a son of God, uh, but he never received the same type of devotion that would normally be offered to a supreme deity. Uh, he had a particular relationship with God and a particular relationship sure. with the people. But that that's a good example of how... Um, something can be similar to the wider phenomena but still have its own discrete distinctives and how in in the in the christian world they've inherited that they've inherited this wider phenomena of ruler cults but it's been inherited through a particular jewish context Hmm. so that's why psalm 110 becomes the number one passage the early church is citing mm. to describe who Jesus is. I mean, this, mm. this was before we had John 3.16, we had Psalm 110. <laughs> this is the number one passage, and you find it in the Gospels, you find it in Paul, in the Catholic epistles, in the book of Revelation. When they want to say, how is Jesus is divine? They go, Psalm 110, and mm. that is how it is. Okay, He mm. is co-enthroned. He is Yahweh's vice regent and proximate and parallel to him in power authority and even in being wow that that's super super helpful now let me go to a, a another passage you talk about in your book uh the idea of moses and how moses is somehow in the passages i believe it's like exodus 7 kind of mm. spoken of as a god so to speak mm. how are we to make sense of who moses is and is there a way we could look at this and say, yeah, this is what this is how early Christians came up with the idea of Jesus through the lens of Moses? Yeah, I mean, if you read um, Exodus seven one, it says, "You shall be a god to Pharaoh, and Aaron mm. shall be your prophet." I mean, that that sounds almost Islamic, you know. Um, there is no there is no god but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. I mean, it it sounds positively Islamic. Mm. And interesting enough, when they do translations of that passage. In Muslim countries, they have to kind of change it a lot. Otherwise, oh. it sounds like, yeah, if you, mm. I read an article about how to translate, was it Exodus 7 1 or 7 2 in Islamic context? They've got to kind of change it up. But, you know, Yahweh says to, you will be a god to Pharaoh. Now, this, this is what I found that in the ancient world, divinity could be very much relational. Okay. So you could be a god in relationship to someone. If you offer salvation, deliverance, benefaction, or patronage to someone, that that, that that meant you had like godlike power over them, and they could respond by giving you godlike thanks, okay? And, I mean, you find this in a, in a, in a number of, of places, I mean, particularly um, in, the, in, the, in the Greco-Roman world. So if a Roman emperor saves a city from invasion, they would say, oh, wow, the emperor, he's like a god to us. Let's mm. let's set up a symbol. Let's, let's worship him like he's a god, that type of thing. So it was a way of showing thanks. Now, no one necessarily thought he was god in the same way that Jupiter or Zeus was a god. But it, 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 was, it was a type of, of relationship. And you find the same thing with Philo. Philo talks about how Moses is the god and king of Israel. But that's not the same. He's not God in the same sense that Yahweh is God. He's God in the sense that he's been the one who has delivered Israel from the hands of Pharaoh, taken them from, um, taken them through the Red Sea, you know, out towards the Promised Land, that type of thing. So he's God in this relational sense. Okay. <clears throat> so you know, and like I said, remember you've got those two senses of divinity. You know, the House of Lords and the mm-hmm. House of Commons. So ima- imagine this, Sean. Imagine you and me go out hiking um, out somewhere in Eastern California and we're there on the, and, and you, and, and you, you stumble, you nearly fall down a cliff. And then me being the quick thinking and agile man, I am, I lunge forward and I grab hold of your hand just before you fall off the edge of the cliff. And I pull you back on and, and Sean says, says oh, Mike, you are my own personal savior. And we, mm. we get back we get back to Talbo and you go into my office and you set up a, a shrine to me with a picture of me and you've got a candle there and you 
you sacrifice a banana to me as a way of showing <laughs> your thanks. And you say, Mike Bird is like a god to me. He delivered me from an, from a death falling down on a cliff or something like that. I mean, that, that would be a contemporary version of the same thing. So mm. uh, a lot of times when people are calling, you know, Moses divine, uh, or like, or sometimes like a, it could be any kind of ancient benefactor or, or king or emperor. Often it's in that, okay, in terms of our personal relationship, uh, it's divine in that sense. So let me just finish off with one uh, final sure. personal an analogy from uh, the Matrix movies. You get a lot of good theology in the Matrix movies. Love it. In the first, mate, the first Matrix movies, um, Neo prints like a disc. Uh, for some guy, mm -hmm. and the guy responds and says, "Oh man, you're my own personal Jesus Christ." Okay? That's right. Now, no one really thinks Keanu Reeves or Neo is Jesus, but because you have saved me from a pickle, you're like my own personal deity. I mean, mm. so th a lot of the discussion of um, divine figures were based more on the cult of benefactors and people who could help you. But it, it, but it wasn't the same thing as a deity, or if it was, it was on a much smaller scale. So that, that's one thing we've got to remember. And even a lot of biblical scholars uh, seem to think that this sort of relational or relative divinity uh, is actually the same thing as the, you know, the big metaphysical divinity. Whereas I think the ancients were very clear that they are two different things. So the example of Moses, you said, is relational. It seems we could probably use the term functional that he operates in a way like God does uh, to the people, but God operates through him, so to speak. There's these figures like the angel of the Lord that move beyond just functional and seem to have yeah. ontological categories. Do you think angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate Jesus? Is it a mystery? Because I don't believe the New Testament ever specifically says Jesus is the angel of the Lord. Even though there's descriptions of Jesus that sound angelic, the New Testament, especially the book of Hebrews, goes out of its way to say Jesus is greater than the angels on so many different levels. So how do you make sense of this angel of the Lord figure? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm, I, here I have to point out, um, I have an interesting discussion with one of my colleagues at Ridley College. I've got an excellent colleague here by the name of Andrew Malone. Um, he's written a book on um you know angels in the old testament uh and and, and he he disagrees fiercely with the christophany okay. thesis so he's so you know my, so your, your viewers and listeners may want to go um check out andrew malone's book about jesus and angels um yeah i mean well first of all like i said the angel of the lord figure is is an interesting figure because it's both Yahweh and not Yahweh. So he kind of speaks mm. in the first person as Yahweh, but is clearly not. He's the one in whom Yahweh's name dwells, which is one of the strongest claims you can make for any angelic figure mm -hmm. in the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, whether Jesus is that, well, I mean, this is where there's a very curious text in, in the book of Jude, where Jude says, um, Jesus rescued the people from Egypt. Now, mm. this is one of those little tricky areas of textual criticism, mm. because in some manuscripts it says Jesus rescued, you know, God's people from Egypt. In other places it says the Lord rescued God's people from Egypt. And, and the, the evidence is kind of evenly matched. Uh, now, I, I tend to think the original reading was Jesus saved um, the, the Israelites out of Egypt. And, and that could be a tacit reference uh, in the New Testament to, to the to the angel of the Lord as being a, uh, a Christophany, an appearance of the pre-incarnate Jesus. And certainly there were others in the early church who thought that. I mean, Justin Martyr was all over that. I mean, you know, he, he thinks, you know, Jesus is the wisdom of God, the word of God, you know, the angel sure. of God. And, and, and this actually is part of the roots why a lot of um, Christian groups, both heretical and orthodox, could use a lot of angelic categories to describe Jesus. In fact, I would mm -hmm. argue amongst the different groups in the early church, um, whether they were like Justin Martyr or Valentinus or or Marcion, probably the only thing they could agree on Christologically is that you know uh, Jesus was uh, the, was probably in some sense the, the great angel of the Lord. So yeah, I mean, uh, this is something that becomes kind of a a, a big deal uh, in the developing church of the. Uh, late first and, and uh, second century. Okay, so if the angel of the Lord is not Jesus, then what other options do we have within a Jewish 
a theistic belief system for somebody who has such divine type qualities in this case wouldn't be Yahweh but seems awfully close to Yahweh would it just be in a exalted angel or who would the angel of the Lord be if not Jesus <clears throat> well that, that's that's the, the number one question um hmm. is the angel of the Lord the pre-incarnate Jesus again very plausible answer um, sure certainly Justin Martyr and, and I think it implied so and it's perhaps implicit in Jude or is the angel Lord just a super duper uber angel um yeah I think okay. some people go to that view as well I, I, to, I think both views are acceptable I don't think um I don't think one either one is heresy or or you know unworkable about it. I think both views are possible uh but it d depends if you like the patristic um christological re-reading of uh of the okay. old testament or not and different people for all sorts of different reasons um find themselves a little bit allergic to that um like okay. you read someone like a melito of sardis he finds jesus everywhere like you know joseph he's a pattern or he's a pattern of um um jesus you know isaac abraham they're all patterns of jesus they either are jesus or they're a kind right. of dress rehearsal for something jesus does so yeah, yeah it's a mixture of prophecy and typology uh, all the way through the old testament okay now you mentioned some of the patristic readings of these passages one of the uh i objections or claims i hear somewhat frequently is that jesus was not really considered to have a divine nature until the fourth century nicene constantinopolitan debates and creeds in other words jesus had certain titles and certain functions but wasn't considered ontologically to have a divine nature you take issue with that by pointing to certain passages in the new testament both in the gospel of john and in the writings of paul where you would say no I think early on there's an ontological sense that Jesus had a divine nature. So if so, what passages do you point to? And then what were the early church fathers doing three to four centuries later? Were they kind of making stuff up or were they just clarifying what you think was already there? Well, Sean, here's my, here's my big confession. I used to think that. I used to think that the Christology of the New Testament was all functional. Jesus performed certain roles or certain activities that were normally attributed to God. Maybe he's part of the divine identity. Maybe he was just worshipped as per uh, a divine being. But all that ontology stuff happened way later, like in the fourth century, mm. you know, the the, un, the unbegotten father and the eternally begotten son. I mean, that all happens. Later. That's what I used to think. But then I was in a, in a bookshop in uh, Washington State in a charming town called Bellingham, and I found a little copy of, uh, of, a, of a book by Plutarch. And Plutarch says in his book, well, you know, there's two types of worship of Apollo, one where he's an unbegotten deity, another one where he's a begotten deity. So they had like two classes of worship. Hmm. And that made me think, well, hang on. This, is, this, this isn't like fourth century language. This is like Plutarch's writing about, you know, around about 100 AD, around the same time that maybe luke acts are written or the gospel of john or the book of revelation and he's using this language of begotten and unbegotten and then i, I went and read some other people read, read me a bit of philo you know um yeah. you know jewish philosopher in alexandra in the first century you know bc ad and yeah i realized this language is incredibly common you know so the idea of you know being begotten unbegotten or a begotten deity this is just part of the furniture and i said well where in the new where in the new testament does jesus fit in and I did find um, them using some ontological language for Jesus. Now, uh, if you go to Philippians 2, that thing, it says, you know, uh, though he was being in the form of God, you've got the, the Greek word huparkon. Mm -hmm. Now, the word being, I mean, ontology is the study of being. So when you talk about Jesus being in the form of God, you can't get much more of a, of a statement other than they're talking about ontology because Paul says, you know, him being ontologically in the form of God means we're talking about ontological categories, okay? What something really is, okay? Or even, um, you know, it, the opening to Hebrews where it talks about, you know, he's the, in his very being, he's the the representation of of, of the God of Israel. I mean, so this, these are clearly ontological languages. And Paul can use this language in his own discourse. He talks about the pagan gods, those who are by nature 
not mm. gods. Well, he says those who are by nature not gods, then what is Jesus by nature? Uh, he, I think Paul would say if, if, if the pagan gods are not by nature gods or not mm. in the highest and truest sense God, then maybe obviously Yahweh, then maybe Jesus is by nature God. And then the fact that people like Paul and John seem to place Jesus on the category of the uncreated deity through whom creation comes into effect. These are the telltale, telltale signs of being an absolute deity, not a mm. relative deity like me rescuing from a cliff, not like someone promoted into deity like a Roman emperor being granted divine honors after his death because he was a good ruler. This means he's an absolute metaphysical deity. And I, I need to, to give you the best example of this. I need to go slightly beyond the New Testament when we look at the okay. uh, an author called Ignatius of Antioch, writing, I think, about 115, 117 before his, his martyrdom in Rome. And in, when he writes to the Ephesians in chapter 7, verse 2, he, he, he refers to Jesus as being both unbegotten and begotten. And that's hmm. in the center of a contrast between Jesus. He's the son of God, son of Mary. He's human and divine. And what I think Jesus is saying is that he is an unbegotten deity. He's an uncreated being, but he's also a human being who's begotten. So mm -hmm. he's begotten insofar he's human, but he's an absolute unbegotten deity. And this is a very clear affirmation that he's truly God and truly man. Uh, or else, to give another example of that, again, this is going slightly uh, beyond the New, the New Testament period. Look at the Epistle of Diognetus, one of my favorite writings outside the New Testament canon. Uh, the author there says that um, the father sent Jesus as a, as a king who sends his son, who is also a king. Okay, and and that thing like hmm. he he sends the king sends his son who is a king, which is a kind of like an argument saying the son of a duck is a duck. Okay, <laughs> okay, the son of God is God, the son of a king is a king, and the son of God is a god, and that that's basically hmm. the argument that's being used, and I think Christians. Uh, certainly in the second century, but with roots in the first century and seen in the New Testament, uh, portray Jesus as not just divine in a relative sense, an honorific sense, in a relational sense or in a functional sense, but in an ontological sense. Mm. Uh, dare we say metaphysically, he is part of the reality, the nature, the substance of divinity. That's really helpful. I think when, a, when apologists make a case for the deity of Jesus, we'll point to a whole bunch of different passages and teachings and actions. Some of them arguably just are functional. Some mm. of them are ontological. Like you said, Philippians 2, citing Isaiah clearly about there being one true God in being. Uh, John chapter 1 is hard to deny, etc. But there's other passages like Jesus experiencing worship. What does that prove about his character and who he was? Because there were certain mm. kings that would receive obeisance. A lot of jo uh, Jehovah's Witnesses will push back on this, for example, and say, well, bowing down is kind of obeisance, not really worship. So what does follow from the exa example we have in the Gospels and even again in Acts of people following down, especially in Revelation, of worshiping mm. Jesus and not angels for the kind of God that Jesus was? Yeah, I mean, this is a good question. So um, worship is how you gave thanks, venerated, placated, you know, showed your love to a deity. Okay, so it was very common in the ancient world. Uh, but, but worship is a pretty broad category. You know, I, I could say I, I I worship the ground my wife walks on. You know, I, I love her so much. I just worship the ground she walks on, as I'm sure you do to, to your own your own dear wife, Sean. Um, but that's not the same worship I have hmm. for the Lord God Almighty. So I mean, they're, they're both a type of worship. So there's degrees of worship. People can provide a type of worship even to angels, like you know, um, you know, if I've if I've got a, if I've got an you know an evil arch enemy. You know, I might try, you know, um, invoke the name of an angel. I, I pray something really bad happens to my enemy. I hope, you know, when he's walking along one day, an apple falls on his head, you know, in the name of the great <laughs> angel, you know, Jigaboth, 
Um, I hope this happens. I mean, that's a type of veneration of because I'm, I'm okay. pleading to an angel to help me out with something. That's a type of worship or veneration since I'm invoking an angel's name. Now, if we look at the book of Revelation, we can see these different types of worship. So in the book of Revelation, in chapter four, you've got the heavenly worship of the Lord Almighty. So this is absolute worship in heaven of the Lord God. So if, if there is a choir in heaven, if there's worship in heaven, this is what we see it looks like. And then we see in chapter five that the lamb also receives heavenly worship hmm. as well. So, I mean, is that the exact same uh, at worship as chapter four? I, I think it, I think it's pretty similar. If it's not absolutely the same, it's at least in the same category. But then in the same book, it talks about the worship of the Roman emperor. That's where you've got like, you know, uh, the beast and the false prophet and the false prophet leads people to worship the beast. So this is the kind of civic worship of the Roman emperor. But then you've got another example in chapter three, the risen Jesus promises, I think it's the church in Philadelphia, that your enemies will come and prostrate themselves before you. You know, which is that type of obeyance. You know, your enemies will come and grovel before you. And then you've got the other issue where John tries to worship the angel and the angel says, dude, don't do that. Totally not cool. You should only worship the Lord your God. And that mm. is not me. And so the, the book of Revelation is a good example of the different types of worship. You get the worship of the Lord Almighty, the worship of the Lamb, which is, I think, analogous to the worship of the Lord Almighty. They've got the imperial cult. You've got people kind of groveling at your feet and the inappropriateness of worshiping the angels. So that this is the issue with, a, with a, the, the category. Now, clearly, John says, you don't worship angels, but you worship Jesus. And the immediate thing is that Jesus is not just a mighty angel mm. because his worship is obviously not the same of angelic worship, it's clearly not the same as the imperial cult worship. Mm -hmm. It's clearly more than, you know, people, your enemies groveling at your feet. It's obviously more like the worship of God in chapter four. So, that, so yeah, worship is a broad disputed category and don't assume that all types of worship are the same. But in the New Testament, and, and I think classically in the book of Revelation, we see Jesus receiving worship, which is not angel worship. It's the worship of the Lord God Almighty. Now, if we go back to the synoptics, where, where the disciples fall down and worship Jesus, doesn't have a lot of the theological flowering and explanation. And I think Revelation makes it clear that Jesus mm. is divine. I mean, you get to Revelation 22, and Jesus is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. It's as clear as it can get about the identity of Jesus. But in the Gospels, they fall down and worship him without some of these distinctions in Revelation. So taken by itself, apart from the rest of the New Testament, would you say that passage alone, only in that context, could be like worshiping Yahweh? Or you would say it's consistent with it, but it's possible that it could have been an other kind of worship in those stories during his life, especially since they're still trying to figure out exactly who Jesus is. Yeah, I mean... When it, you have to remember, Jesus' identity in the Gospels is a bit of a mystery. I mean, it's like Jason Bourne. It's kind of like, man, this guy is cool. Who is he? Who is he? He's, he's, he's I mean, okay. uh, Jason Bourne's a good analogy or a bad one. But it's like, who is this guy? And he 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 he, he speaks with unmediated divine authority. He can forgive sins. Um, he doesn't just kind of, you know, pray to nature. He, he bosses nature around. Hmm. Okay? He heals people, exorcisms, which are proof of the kingdom of God. Um, possibly the Messiah, definitely a holy man, full of the Spirit of God, that type of thing. And now when people bow down and worship him, um, I, I have to say, to be perfectly honest, I, I, it doesn't necessarily have to be the same as I, of um, Revelation 4 and 5 worship. Okay. You could argue it's more of that sense of um, thanksgiving, kind of like when Mike saved Sean from falling off the cliff. Because, okay, this man has healed my daughter, healed my son, um, you know, I'm going to just bow down and worship him, uh, you know, offer him that. So in that sense, I, I would argue maybe it's closer to obeying something like that. But when you get to the resurrection narratives, I think of Matthew 28, you know, mm. when, the, when, when they finally do meet the risen Jesus, then they worship him. And this isn't just to say, oh, yeah, thanks for healing my daughter. 
or, you know, or thanks for kind of, you know, um, casting a demon out of, you know, a family member. When they worship the risen Jesus, I think this is beginning to be, go beyond um, worship to a patron or someone's helped you out in hard times. This is worship of a divine being. So when certainly when you get into um, Matthew 28, Luke 24, the sort of worship you get there, that I think is divine worship. Prior to that, I'm less convinced that that is divine worship. That may just be thanking a patron for helping you out in a, in a, in a difficult spot. That's super helpful. I really appreciate that distinction. You do that a lot in your book. That's why I read it twice, and I want to make sure viewers see that this is like a 400-page book. It's an academic book, but it's not just filled with Greek and scholarly footnotes that an interested layperson can't follow. Uh, I, I'm going to recommend it as highly as I can recommend a book. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Now I don't read a ton of fiction, Mike, so it's not like I sat down and was like in tears and moved like a fictional story, but I enjoyed it because I was like, oh, that brings clarity. That brings understanding. You connected some dots in my mind for me. Uh, so check out Jesus Among Gods if you watching this want a sense of where our Christological debates taking place right now. Uh, within academia. Highly recommend it. Uh, before you click away, make sure you hit subscribe. We've got some other interviews coming up you're not going to want to miss here on Christology, on uh, some other interviews on demons and their nature, spiritual warfare, archaeological videos. Don't miss it. If you want to go deeper and learn apologetics, two ways. Number one, we have a certificate program, which we will help you from a distance. And I just got word today that with the discount code below, it's 50% off if somebody uses that, which is really cool. I think it used to be 30%. We also have a master's program anywhere in the world. We have people around the world. We've had folks in Australia, Mike, which is really cool. It's a fully distance program, top rated apologetics program. We do a lot of work in Christology. I teach a class on the resurrection. If you have an undergrad degree, we'd love to train you information below. Mike, let's do it again. Uh, really appreciate your work and your clarity, and uh, this is a lot of fun. Okay, well, it's been great talking to you, Sean, and I hope uh, all your listeners and viewers have enjoyed it. Catch you around the channel or maybe next time.